In this video, I want to talk about gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is sort of like the reverse pathway of glycolysis. Gluconeogenesis comes from gluco, meaning glucose, neo, meaning new, and genesis, meaning to make or create. So we're synthesizing glucose from pyruvate, which is essentially sort of the reversal of glycolysis, but it's not the exact reversal of glycolysis. The reason why is because <coughs> excuse me, there were three irreversible steps, right, in glyco glycolysis. The three irreversible glycolytic steps from glycolysis, they can't they're not really irreversible. What that means is irreversible is that they're that step can't be reversed by that particular enzyme. It needs a different enzyme. So the three irreversible glycolytic steps need different they need different enzymes to be reversed. Okay. So how many steps then is gluconeogenesis? Glycolysis was 10 steps. Gluconeogenesis is actually 11 steps. Now why is that? The reason why is because the pyruvate kinase step from glycolysis needs to be reversed. It needs two steps to be reversed. So all of the steps from glycolysis can be reversed in one step except the pyruvate kinase step. It needs two steps. So that extra step is the reason why gluconeogenesis is 11 steps long and 11 reactions long instead of just 10. Now let's get into these these uh these enzymes. So in glycolysis the first step was taking glucose and turning it into glucose 6-phosphate. Now this would be the if going backwards, going from glucose 6-phosphate to alpha D-glucose, this would be the last step in gluconeogenesis. And this is actually catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate phosphatase. And the reason why is because phosphatases, if you recall, they are enzymes that hydrolyze phosphate groups off of molecules. So here we're going, we're losing this this um, this phosphate group here. We're inputting a water. We're inputting water, and we're losing that phosphate group. Now, um, this reaction actually occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum of the liver. The endoplasmic reticulum, which I will abbreviate as ER, um, of the liver. So this would be, of course, the, the last step of gluconeogenesis. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Now, Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate was the committed molecule to glycolysis. Now, if that step is going to be reversed, it definitely can't be reversed by the phosphofructokinase that created it. So we're going to go back to fructose 6-phosphate by getting rid of this phosphate group here. We're very much in the same way that we did up here with this glucose 6-phosphatase. This thing, though, it's not acting on glucose 6-phosphate. Instead, it's acting on fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, so it's going to be called fructose... 1,6 bisphosphatase. So it's going to, again, hydrolyze one of those phosphate groups off and results in fructose 6-phosphate. So recall, the reversal of this, up, this step up here was the hexokinase step. Here, um, if we were, the glycolytic step would be going from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and that's catalyzed by fructose, or oh, excuse me, phosphofructokinase 1. But in this case, we have um, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase catalyzing this, this glu gluconeogenic step. Um, so that's it for, for that one in terms of that, that re reversing that reaction. Now, 
this here at the end here um, are the other two steps. So now I mentioned that uh, the pyruvate kinase step needs two steps to be reversed. So going from phosphoenopyruvate to, to pyruvate was one step in glycolysis. But now in order to get from pyruvate back over to phosphoenopyruvate, we have to do it in two steps. And the reason why was because the pyruvate kinase step was highly exergonic. It was very spontaneous. It released a lot of energy. So in order to reverse that, we're actually going to have to input some energy and actually go through two steps. So this first step here, uh, going from pyruvate, this three carbon molecule, we're going to turn it into oxaloacetate. And notice this is a new molecule. We haven't seen this molecule just yet. So notice the difference between these these two carboxyl groups are the same up here. These two ketone groups are the same. This methyl group here is the CH2 group here. But notice the difference is that we added this carboxyl group here. So this enzyme is actually called pyruvate carboxylase. And this, of course, would be um, the first step of gluconeogenesis. So it's pyruvate carboxylase. So we're adding a carboxyl group to pyruvate. Again, the enzyme name makes sense. So we have to include this here. We're adding, we're adding a carboxyl group. We're actually adding it as a carbon dioxide. Now, if you know this, carbon dioxide is a gas, and uh, typically, in order to in order to insert a gas into a reaction, it's not the like the easiest thing to do. And this is definitely an endergonic process. And we're going to use a form of energy, if you recall. ATP is the energy currency in our cell, and that's exactly what we're going to use to drive forward this reaction here. So we're going to invest in ATP, and what's going to end up happening is we're going to hydrolyze that so as to uh, power this reaction. We have not that turned into an ADP, and that phosphate group doesn't actually get to attached to the oxaloacetate, so it ends up just being here, freed up. And that's essentially what happens here. So, actually, one more thing I forgot to mention about this enzyme up here is that this occurs, this enzyme is in the, is the cytosol of cells. But pyruvate carboxylase, this reaction occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. Mitochondrial matrix of the cell. Okay, so pyruvate carboxylase occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, uh, whereas the rest of the steps occur in the cytosol. Now, again, just to recall, we added this carboxyl group, hence the carboxylase. We're adding it to pyruvate, hence pyruvate carboxylase. And this, ener this is going to require energy to go back to oxaloacetate. And it makes sense here that we can actually invest this energy, because if we're undergoing gluconeogenesis, that means we want to go... Um, we probably have enough energy. We don't want glycolysis to go. We don't want glycolysis and gluconeogenesis both happening in the same cell at the same time. Because glycolysis makes energy by breaking down glucose, and gluconeogenesis stores energy by creating glucose. So we definitely don't want both processes happening at the same time. But just sort of as a heads up, we only want glucogen gluconeogenesis to happen when we want to store energy. And it would make sense that we would have ATP around if we're ready to store energy. We want to store energy when in high energy states. If we already have plenty of energy, that's when we store stuff, store energy. So in this case, we have ATP being used up because it's already around. There's plenty of it around. Okay. Now once we have this oxaloacetate here, we're going to turn that into phosphoenopyruvate. The enzyme that catalyzes that reaction is phospho enol pyruvate carboxykinase let's see if we can make sense of this enzyme name phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase so I'm gonna look for a carboxyl group either coming or leaving and I'm kinase I'm, I'm expecting the addition of a phosphate and that's exactly what we get here so notice that between these two two molecules um, the carboxyl group up here stays the same. Um, the CH2 group here is the same. But we form this alkene and we add a phosphate here, right? So we're inputting a phosphate for sure somehow, and it's from a kinase. Um, but we're also losing this carboxyl group. So we're going to lose that carboxyl group as a carbon dioxide. 
But where did this, this phosphate come from? Well, it's a kinase. Now, normally when we think about kinases, we think about it adding a phosphate from ATP. But for whatever reason, in this case, instead of an ATP, we're actually adding it from a GTP. So we're going from a GTP to a GDP, and the phosphate from the GTP gets attached to create phospholinopyruvate. And this, of course, occurs in the cytosol. I don't have room. Do I have room? I don't want to squeeze it in there. This occurs in the cytosol. Okay, so that's essentially it. In the next video, I'll talk about how some of these enzymes are allosterically regulated. But that's essentially it as far as gluconeogenesis goes. Every other step in gluconeogenesis uh, was reversible from glycolysis. So if you were writing out that step, you would just have to make sure that you were writing the arrow um, from one way to the other. So um, I'll actually show a quick example in another video. Thanks for watching.